a day that saw the unexpected release of security camera video from a Paris hotel on the night Diana died. A day that saw a surprise appearance by the Queen and later words of appreciation. She never lost her capacity to smile and laugh nor to inspire others with her warmth and kindness. I admired and respected her, for her energy and commitment to others. And finally, Diana's last trip to Kensington Palace, her London home. Tonight, farewell to a princess. This is ABC News Nightline, reporting from London, Ted Koppel. You could have wandered through the streets of London today and imagined that every flower in Europe had been cut to serve as a floral tribute to Diana. You could have edged your way through the throngs of people massing outside Buckingham and Kensington palaces. You could have walked along the seemingly endless queue of mourners waiting to sign one of the books of condolence at St. James's Palace and imagined that memorializing Diana was London's only function today. You could have come here to Westminster Abbey many hours ago and already have found rank upon rank of those who want to be sure of bearing witness to the funeral that will only begin more than six hours from now. The premature death of this young princess has turned into an event of such gigantic proportions that we can only give you a sense of it by sampling for you some of the events that have been unfolding over this last day and a half. It is 35 hours before the start of the funeral, before the funeral of Diana, Princess of Wales, opens with the Westminster Abbey choir and congregation singing, God Save the Queen. The night is cool but dry. Many already have been camped out along the procession route for most of a day. One man says, she did so much for the homeless. I can go homeless for two nights, for her. At St. James Palace, Diana's body lies just behind the stained glass windows of the Queen's Chapel. As the week had gone on, the crowds had grown even bigger. What began as a few rows of flowers now spills into the street, and still they keep coming. Wait, unfortunately you can't lay them this side. Lay them that side. Oh, no. There's too many here. Yeah, okay. so there is a softness in the voice, a mood. As the funeral approaches, the heaviness deepens. It's just so overwhelming. I don't know. Everyone just feels it. It's the quiet. It's, it's very eerie. It's the smell, the flowers. It's just everything. Everything. It's just a shame. With most of the flowers, there are personal notes. One here reads, Diana, thank you for everything you have done in your short life. I didn't know how much I loved you until it was too late. I'm sorry. People have lined up all week to inscribe personal messages in the book of condolences. This will be the last day to sign it here. And the line swells with each hour. Tonight, the police estimate, there are 17,000 people waiting. The end of the queue is at uh, the uh, far end of the mall, which is about, uh, it's about eight or nine hours now the queue at the moment. That's not too long for Lucy Allen and Katie Taylor. I know once I go home, if I, come, if I go home and don't come back, I'm going to regret it for the rest of my life, so... By this time, wholesale flower markets are in full swing, trying desperately to keep up with the demand. Well, it's been crazy. Uh, as, as the week's gone on, the demand for flowers has got, as people have seen the flowers on television, it's just snowballed. 
It's going, it's going crazy. For the people who have settled in for a two-day wait along the procession route leading up to Westminster Abbey, their presence is its own statement. The princess has done a lot for the country, and she's done a lot for the children and for the homeless, and this is the way we can show our respect to her. We've never had a, a princess like her before, and we, I doubt if we'll ever have one again. But there is talk lots of talk about the royal family, about their isolation in Scotland, about their silence, about their failure to make an obvious gesture. You look all around you and there are flags being flown at half mast. You look at Buckingham Palace and there's nothing. I think that's the most damaging thing that they've done. I feel very upset and um, annoyed over it. It's upset me and the whole nation of the um, British public. Royal protocol bars the flying of any flag over Buckingham Palace when the Queen is not in residence. But that doesn't stop the grumbling, yes. the unsolicited advice. I think the British people don't, don't feel as though she's caring, as though she, she's really just closed the door on her, you know, from the beginning, really. I feel like William and Harry, like my son, says, please cry. William and Harry are being told, I feel, from their family and the whole... Um, let's say royalty upbringing is not to not to show any emotion to be the stiff british upper lip but i just feel like no it's okay because diana her whole life she's just shown you know she's just come very much from the heart she's lived her life from the heart and she's helped the people who really really needed it an israeli couple who have lived in london for some time wonder at this outpouring of emotion for diana that she make it okay for people to come and to mourn and to, um, and to cry. And you can see when you go around, you can see men that are crying, you can see women. And I think English tradition is that you don't show your feeling, you don't show sentiment. The last week I feel a different England. Why? Why? Because people express their, their feeling. People speak. People can, 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 can understand now what Diana did for them. And they are not hiding their feelings anymore. They're crying, they're shouting, they're talking. The newspapers are rolling off the presses carrying the news that the Queen has scheduled an early evening address to the nation and will allow the flag to fly at half-staff over Buckingham Palace on Saturday. The news is conveyed as though it were a victory. The Queen bows to her people. It is a stunning reversal that creates very mixed feelings among the people creeping along the condolence line. I just think that they could have done a bit more. The Queen could have made her speech a bit sooner than tomorrow. I think the flag could have been, you know, half mass from the day that she did die. And um, I just think they've done it in a very poor way. Yeah, it's disappointing about them. But in the same respect, they've got the grieve as well. Yeah. And yeah, until it happens, happens to you, you don't know what it feels like. Yeah, but the uh, thing that annoys me the most is that the Queen's going to make a speech tomorrow. Why? Yeah. What's what, the point? What's, you know, she's, she's only the, doing it. She's only, she's only flying the flag at half mast because everybody's told her to. Others have even stronger feelings, like this woman, who finally made it through the line. Diana was the only flame keeping the royal family going. A graveyard. That's how I would describe them. Cold. Miserable and horrible. Now, grab that in. As the night chill begins to cut, the Fayed family sends refreshment trucks from Harrods to express their appreciation. You have a nice night. Bye bye. Katie, Lucy, and their group have yet to make it halfway. Longer than what we expected, but it's all been good fun. At the back of the line, new arrivals the birds from Manchester including four-and-a-half-month-old Timothy and two-and-a-half-year-old Katie. The wait is now 11 hours. They say they had to be here, but they understand why the Queen has stayed away. The royals are no different to any other family in the country. You know, if someone dies in your family that's close to you, you shut your doors, draw your curtains, and just want to be left alone. You can't blame them for that. The Queen had not planned to come to London until tomorrow, just before the funeral. But as dawn broke this morning, they were preparing to leave Balmoral Castle in Scotland. The Queen, Prince Philip, 
Prince Charles, and the two young princes, William and Harry. Also flying in, two Americans injured by landmines. They had traveled to Bosnia this summer with Diana and were scheduled to have a working meeting with her in London today. Now, they are coming to a funeral. But at Buckingham Palace, there is still no flag. Not this day. Not, at least, on the roof. One of the notes with the flowers reads, Die free at last. They took your life but they could not take your pride. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Service Star. Service Star and Coast to Coast stores. I could use something for this headache, Liz. I've got Tylenol. I thought you used something else. No, my doctor told me to switch. Really? How come? He said Tylenol won't irritate my stomach the way aspirin and even ibuprofen sometimes can. And Tylenol's strong enough. Oh, yeah. It works great. To avoid the risk of stomach irritation, Tylenol is the pain reliever doctors recommend most. You ready for more guy talk? I am now. Tylenol the pain reliever hospitals use most. Sunday, a special this week. Cokie Roberts from London. The day after Princess Diana's funeral. The future of the royal family. Plus, the crash investigation. This week, Sunday. I'm Reba McIntyre, recognizing Primus Automotive Financial Services, a company that's making a difference in Middle Tennessee through the Schools Now program. At Primus, our employees make a difference. A quality education is the key to a bright future for their children and yours. That's why all of us at Primus encourage you to purchase a Schools Now coupon booklet. By supporting Middle Tennessee schools, Primus is making a sound investment in the future. Support Schools Now! We're just for Pete, the world's largest athletic shoe store, and it's time for our biggest clothing sale of the year. The 50% off clothing sale. Warm-ups, jackets, selected caps, jerseys, t-shirts, shorts, and more. 50% off. Names like Reebok, No Fear, Adidas, Timberland, Fila, Logo Athletic, Wilson, and Starter. 50% off. College and Pro, we've got your favorite jackets and jerseys. All 50% off. And all shoes are on sale, too. The 50% off sale. This week at Just for Pete with the 13th Pairs pre Friday morning. They have come here to Kensington Palace as though drawn by some irresistible force. No one has urged them to come. No one could have required this ocean of flowers. No one has dictated the thousands upon thousands of notes and poems. This may be as huge and spontaneous an outpouring of grief and tribute as any in memory. It was here at Kensington Palace where Diana lived and worked that the American members of the Land Mine Survivors Group had an appointment to meet with the princess. We now have a Mrs. Berry White here. We had an appointment with you at 12.15, apparently. Over. Now they wanted to pay their personal respects to her staff. She fought for our cause, and she believed in our cause, and she's really the first person to really believe in us so much that, that we knew in our hearts she would be there for the long, for the long run with us. The wait to sign the condolence books has stretched from the expected three hours to more than 12. I got here about 12.30. 12.30 last night? Yeah. And you've been standing here all that time. It's, yeah. it's now just coming up on 12.30 yeah. in, the 12, in the afternoon. Yeah, 10, Did you have any idea it was going to be this long? No, when I came, they said it would be about six hours. 
It is all for this, for a few minutes to add a few words to a book of condolences. Andy French Simmons waited in line all night to deliver a message. Yeah. A message from a wife? She was. Sorry. I feel such a loss, yet I never even knew the lady. Just, just the, can't be put into words. I just thought Di, you were simply fair. To me, she was simply fair, and she'd always be fair. I just thought sadly missed, but never forgotten. Um, my love and fault with your son, William and Harry. You can see the princess and uh, Mr. Dodie are surrounded by paparazzi as they try to make their way into the hotel. At 1.30 this afternoon, events and images begin to collide in a jarring fashion. Harrod's department store, owned by the father of Dodi Fayed, releases videotape excerpts taken by security cameras at the Ritz Hotel in Paris last Saturday night. We see Princess Diana and Dodi Fayed leaving the hotel, about to embark on their fateful drive. A spokesman for Harrod says the pictures are being made public to prove that the driver shows no evidence of having been drunk, as French police have alleged. As the video is shown for the first time early this afternoon, a plane carrying Prince Charles and his two sons lands in London. The Queen, her sister, Princess Margaret, their mother, and Prince Philip are just leaving Balmoral Castle in Scotland on their way to London. Members of the royal family, stung by criticism that they have guarded their privacy too zealously for most of this past week, are about to make several public appearances. Two of the American landmine survivors, Jerry White and Ken Rutherford, have just completed their visit to Kensington Palace when Prince Charles and his two sons arrive on the scene. We had no idea we were ambling about outside and in an area that had been blocked off and we just had inside access and started to look at the beautiful notes and the flowers and very powerful and moving and it's quite a scene uh, mm -hmm. crowds and crowds of people watching and then we looked up and there were prince charles william and harry coming in through the gates were you able to make any kind of, I mean, I know you, you talked, and, and when I say were you able to make contact, did you feel any kind of personal contact? I guess the impression that hit me is, is this uh, Prince William, he has a lot of his mother in him. And I said, Jerry, you said that we went to Bosnia with your mom, and he said, I know, she told me. I said that she gave hope to a lot of people in Bosnia. He said, I know, she liked people. It was very short, very sweet. But they, very nice. and Harry, who has, reminds me of my daughter Quince with this impish, you know, look, was, um, we wanted to tell him too that his mother was remarkable, but, you know, and that we had lots of fun with her. She was funny, fun, and, uh, you just want those boys to know amazing she was and that they inherit that you feel it very deeply don't you yeah. and that's why you, you don't quite want to talk about it but it is our prayer and wish for them and for the whole family at 240 Queen Elizabeth II and Prince Philip emerge from Buckingham Palace and begin walking along the rows and piles and garlands of flowers, occasionally bending over to read the messages and then walking over to the police barricade to exchange a few words with members of the crowd. That's very kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Scenes such as these may yet prove to be the Princess Diana's most enduring legacy where once the British public was content to have its royal family aloof and distant, reserved and regally unemotional, Diana touched them emotionally and literally. She moved the British people by moving among them, and there has been deep resentment these past few days 
at the royal silence emanating from Balmoral. The millions of flowers, and at times today it seemed as though no one was moving through the center of London without carrying one or more bouquets, the outpouring of sentiment has seemed at times as much of a reproach to the rest of the royal family as it was an expression of love for Diana and her common touch. This mingling of the Queen and Prince Philip with the people was both uncharacteristic and unplanned. In the end, it was also unavoidable. Indeed, by the end of the afternoon, the Queen was moved to an unprecedented act, a live television speech to the nation. That, when we come back. This was not something totally unfamiliar to Queen Elizabeth, this business of a British sovereign mingling with the people. When she was a girl, herself still a princess, and London was being pounded nightly by German bombers and rockets, Elizabeth's father, King George, used to walk through some of the battered ruins of London, giving comfort and courage to the people. Her own reign as queen, though, has been marked as much as anything by the exploits of her dysfunctional family keeping that family somehow together appeared at times to be her greatest challenge, and it was not one that she could meet in public. She never pretended to take the divorce of her son Charles from the Princess Diana lightly or well, and so it may have been the desire to avoid hypocrisy that has kept Queen Elizabeth from making too great a show of public grief over Diana's untimely death. Whatever the reason, the British public did not treat her apparent indifference kindly. And so, this evening at six, speaking from an open window in Buckingham Palace, with the square in front of the palace visible in the background, the Queen did something she rarely does. She delivered a television speech. Since last Sunday's dreadful news, we have seen throughout Britain and around the world an overwhelming expression of sadness of Diana's death. We visited several locations around the city to gauge public reaction to the Queen's speech. I think it's fitting that she's, she's come around and done it now. And I think, I think she put a lot of thought in what she said. And uh, it was nice to see her pay the tribute to Diana. But I think if she hadn't have done it, there would have been a lot of dissent within the public. Well, I think uh, she should have been down there before, and she's been up at Balmoral all week. She should have been down back in Buckingham Palace before, and... and made herself a speech before today, like a day before the funeral. The two Americans we met earlier who enlisted Diana's support in their crusade against landmines were clearly drawn to the princess, but divided over the Queen's televised remarks. I the we can call wherever we are. Join in expressing our grief at Diana's loss and gratitude for her all too short life. It is a chance to show to the whole world the British nation united in grief and respect. May those who died rest in peace. And may we, each and every one of us, thank God for someone who made many, many people happy. I didn't really see the emotion that I was looking for. I didn't expect to see the emotion, but I would have liked to have seen it. Um, I think that's what a lot of people were hoping for to sort of wipe away that stiff upper lip, at least for a day or two, and um, become more human, like, like Diana was. Because that's the Diana we knew. I think that would have been appropriate for at least a couple of days. It's really a time for sympathy. Here's a grandmother who is grieving. Whether you see it on the outside or not, I wouldn't doubt for a second that she is extremely pained inside for her, for the children, the family, the whole situation, I, I have no doubt, and I think it's, it's sort of wrong to have a certain expectation. Um, she's in pain. 
It was among the least fortunate Britons that Diana may have made her greatest impact. Among AIDS and cancer patients, drug addicts, alcoholics, and the homeless. And so we also visited a shelter for the homeless in one of London's working class districts to gauge the impact of the Queen's speech and Diana's death. She come there to me as well, sent a point from Vauxhall. She come in there. She said, go out and she talked to us like we were just normal people and like she was a normal person. And what of the Queen's speech? She said everything right. What she said was all right. The, the fact that we have lessons to learn from her life and, 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 and the reactions to her death. As often as I asked about the Queen's remarks, though, reaction always drifted back to Diana. Everybody's had some sort of trouble, and where there was, um, and if they joined an organization, um, she'd be there. Uh, somehow, she, um, everybody <clears throat> who had any trouble um, had heard that she'd been to that place um, talking to people. I think we appreciate the difference between the, the proximity, the, the, the closeness of Diana, that, that she did um, come and visit um, the less fortunate, uh, as opposed to the distance of the, of the Queen and the rest of the royal family, who do not do anything of the sort. And then, shortly after the Queen finished her speech, just when it seemed that this strange day could not hold many further surprises, news of a woman whose entire life was spent among the poor. Around 7 o'clock this evening here in London, word that Mother Teresa had died in Calcutta. Surely no two women could have seemed less alike than the tiny, saint-like, wizened old nun whose very name became a synonym for charity and self-sacrifice and the tall, glamorous, jet-setting princess. And yet their lives not only touched, but in the manner that each woman was revered by the sick and the poor, there is the suggestion that they must have had something, at least, in common. Something beyond the curious fact that Diana and Mother Teresa died in the same week. And then, just as night fell, about a quarter after eight, the procession carrying Diana's body to her former home began its journey. From St. James Palace, where she had spent the past five nights in solitary state, it passed quiet crowds lining the roof. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. First, a lone motorcycle escort, followed by the hearse, carried Diana's coffin, draped with the royal standard. Heading down the mall, past the Victoria Memorial, in front of Buckingham Palace, heralded by a wave of flashbacks. Then, the gradual climb up Constitution Hill. Behind the hearse, a Bentley, carrying Prince Charles and his sons, Princes William and Harry. Trailing, a car carrying two clergymen, who will hold vigil with the princess through the night. Past the great monuments of London, the Marble Arch, and the Wellington Arch at Hyde Park Corner, into Knightsbridge, along Hyde Park. Tomorrow's funeral cortege will come back on a parallel road in the park. The entire two and a half mile route packed with quiet emotion and enormous crowds. A harbinger of tomorrow. past the Royal Albert Hall, whose flag flies at half-mast. As the procession passes, the crowd falls in behind. Turning up Palace Avenue, approaching the princess's home along a narrow path. When we come back, some of the thoughts and sentiments of people here in London late tonight. It is 10 minutes after 5 o'clock in the morning here in London, and you're looking at a live shot of Westminster Abbey bathed in light this morning. 
And there, before the gate through which I believe the funeral procession will enter Westminster Abbey tomorrow, yet another bank of flowers. But all around this abbey, people are gathered and have been gathered for many hours now. And it is almost as though London were surrounded, or at least Westminster Abbey were surrounded by tens of thousands of homeless people because temporarily they have chosen to be homeless. Out here in the cold night air, some of them wearing only the suits that they will have for the funeral tomorrow, a few of them wrapped in, in blankets, some of them who have wrapped themselves in, in nothing more than garbage bags. But there they are by the tens of thousands now waiting for the funeral which will begin some five hours from now. We went out onto the streets of London late this evening to hear some of the voices of the people who have come for this final moment. I'm sorry. You know, she's gone too quick. She's gone too early. She had a lot to do. I just hope it shakes us up a little bit. I just hope it tells... Well, I think the people were going to say it. They already are. You've seen the flowers. Go and have a look. If you haven't... Nah, this, this is ours. She's ours. And I flew in this morning. Um, it was a, a last-minute decision to come over here, and I, the more I thought about it, the more I wanted to come. Um, I admired Diana enormously, and I think that she was a phenomenal human being. And I also think this is a very important moment in, in uh, our generation and, and even in history. This whole week, the whole country, we've heard different bits and pieces about Princess Diana. And we just wanted to come and say our own goodbyes. I think she just touched so many people and everybody can relate to her in a different way. And, and we, we literally felt, it may sound strange, we literally felt drawn to be here today. They've been trying to find comparisons for Diana. They've been comparing her to various women. But yet you can't compare Diana to anyone. Diana was Diana. It's just a woman who touched everybody of all ages. We don't think there'll be anybody ever like her again. What's going on here really goes beyond sheer mourning and is really approaching worship. I don't know if you've seen all the shrines that are, that are starting up, but there's almost a, a, an adoration. A lot of the cards that are written here are written to Saint Diana. And she was such a wonderful woman. She was so loved and just a beautiful woman and she seems so important. She'll be missed. And I'll be back with a closing thought in a moment. England is in the process of obscuring a life and creating a legend. Only a week or so ago, Diana was still a controversial figure in this country, a thorn in the side of the monarchy, criticized in some quarters of the government for venturing into political matters, including, it should be noted, her support for the abolition of landmines. As a divorcee, she was certainly entitled to keep company with whomever she chose, but Dodi Fayed, with his fast-track playboy reputation, was hardly seen in this country as the ideal stepfather of a future king. None of that matters anymore. Diana, as it turns out, struck a more responsive chord in the hearts of the English people than any surviving member of the royal family, with the possible exception of her two sons. It is her kindness to the least fortunate members of society that endeared her to so many. But it is also her stubbornness in not bending to the establishment that made her the perfect object of admiration to anyone frustrated with authority. In a few hours, the sometimes troubled young woman will be laid to rest. But the legend has just been born. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in London for all of us here at ABC News. Good night. Unchain my heart. And we will let me go. Unchain my heart. Cause you don't love me no more. El Dorado Touring Coupe with the 300 horsepower North Star system. Isn't it time you live without limits?
Nightline has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. ABC News, now always on.